example. Whenever current is flowing through a circuit, electric fields are set up inside the wire. And those electric fields mean that there is a distribution of surface charge. So whenever you have 100 milliamps flowing through a circuit, remember that there has to be some distribution of charge on the outer periphery of the circuit. Okay. Now, generally we think that current has nothing to do with the geometry of the circuit. But let me draw another circuit. And let me label this section as arbitrarily shaped, as an arbitrary shaped loop. And let's find out how feedback works in this case. Now I have the same battery. Remember, I'm not talking about what's going to happen inside the battery. There has to be electric field inside the battery as well. And remember, let me leave this as a surprise. This electric field is pointing in this direction inside the battery. The electric field outside is pointing in the other direction. So this is typical of batteries, and I'm going to explain this in some more detail. Remember, these concepts you'll not find in, a good, in most textbooks. So please pay attention. Now let's look at the same battery, but a different geometry of the circuit. And now I'm not going to talk about the closure of a circuit, rather it's a closed circuit already. But I make this circuit at time t equals zero. Let me draw the circuit first. I have a battery. Now, this is positively charged, this terminal. This terminal is negatively charged. So at the instant that this circuit is closed or that circuit has been created at time zero, the only electric field that exists inside this space is the electric field due to the battery. And it's a dipolar field. So if I have a dipole like this, which is a battery, this is a dipole. I know that the electric field lines are going to point like this. And so on. All right. Now let's look at the electric field in the wire due to the battery. Just due to the battery. The dipolar field. And I call this field E battery and I represent this in white. The electric field here is going to point like this. Here it's going to point in this general direction, right? It's going to point pointing downwards. Here it's going to point like this. Here it's going to point like this. Here it's going to point like this. Here it's going to point in this, this general direction. Here it's going to point in this general direction. These vectors are large. These vectors is small. This is smaller and this is even smaller. Why are these vectors smaller? Because this point is further away from the battery. And this is a one over R cube dependence of the electric field from the dipole. So you go further away, these electric fields become smaller. This is a small electric field, but still it exists. Now look at the direction of these electric fields. Okay? Initially at the point that this circuit has been set up. Now if in response to this electric field, I want to draw the drift velocity of the mobile C of electron. It's going to point everywhere opposite to the local electric field. Remember, the electric field is a local concept. So here the drift velocity is going to point like this. Here it's going to point like this. That's the drift velocity of the electrons. These are negatively charged particles. Here it's going to point like this. Here it's going to point like this. Here it's this, 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 like this, and like this. So electrons are coming out from this terminal of the battery in a sense, but locally electrons, those electrons do not travel all the way by the way. But what in effect happens is that a bunch of electrons comes out and a bunch of electrons leaves the wire and enters the battery. So the electrons do not in effect travel all the way throughout the circuit. It's just that electrons everywhere are responding to local electric fields, remember that. But this is the general direction of the drift velocity. Okay? And the conventional current is in opposite direction. Either they can go. Some of the electrons are traveling like this. 
Okay? And remember what I mean by travel. So the electrons are, have a drift velocity in this direction. The current is flowing as it should in the circuit. So everything is fine here, fine here, fine here, fine here, fine here. But lo and behold, the electrons are moving in the wrong, wrong direction in this section of the wire. The electrons should actually have a drift velocity in this direction. Because the, you would like the electrons to move through the circuit in this general direction. So here the electrons are moving in the wrong direction. Here the electrons are moving in the correct direction. As they should in a circuit. Now this, let's call this, label this point as point number one. This is some point in the wire. Now what's going to happen immediately is that from the perspective of point one, there are mobile electrons here, but these mobile electrons are rushing away from this point on, on the top branch, and they're rushing away from the point on the bottom bra branch. Let's call this branch two, and let's call this branch three. So in branches 2 and 3, the electrons are moving away from point 1. Here they are moving in this direction, here they are moving in this direction. So instantaneously, the current seem to be in the improper directions in this branch. And as a result, what's going to happen is that this region is going to get depleted of electrons. Because from both of its branches, the electrons are receding away. So this side of the branch gets depleted of electrons. Depleted ka matlab khali ho gaya, iska daman electron se, and the positive charge develops here instantaneously. It could be a small positive charge, but nevertheless it develops because it's depleted of electrons. Now what's going to happen here is, let's see what's going to happen here. At this section of the wire, Electrons are coming in from 3 and the electrons are coming in from section 5. Look at the direction of these orange vectors. So electrons are rushing into point 4. So this bend of the wire gets a preponderance or gets a higher density of electrons than usual. So this end of the wire becomes negatively charged. Now we have a positive charge end here that has suddenly developed because of the electric fields that were instantaneously set up and the preponderance of negatively charged electrons here. Now what's going to happen is that this positive section of the wire and this negative section of the wire is going to create a new electric field. Let's call that field E wire. And this has been created out of feedback because feedback occurs and this positive charge and this negative charge is now separated out, it creates an electric field of its own. Now what's the direction of that electric field? Is it pointing from 1 to 4 or from 4 to 1? It's going to point from 1 to 4 because it's positively charged. So a new electric field is set up inside this section, it points in this direction. Now this electric field is in the proper direction. Now what we have is an original electric field a white electric field due to the battery and a new electric field that has been set up inside the wire because of feedback because of this skewed distribution of charges now you find the net electric field at this point which is going to be the vector sum of the white field and the blue field so initially if I were to close up on this section 3 initially the electric field was just due to the battery. Then a small electric field developed that was in the opposite direction. This field. But still this field is not strong enough to reverse the direction of the original field. But as more and more charge accumulates here and accumulates here, this field grows in time. And if you draw the resultant of both of these fields, so this is the field at time zero, and as time increases, the field grows in size. So this field first diminishes, right? Now I'm drawing in here on the resultant of the white and the blue. Now this field grows larger, so this field diminishes. Then it changes its direction because the field due to the wire has grown in such a large amount because this accumulation of charges has grown in such a way that this field exceeds this original field, the the dipolar field. The dipolar field remains constant by the way because nothing is happening to the battery. 
eventually the net electric field is going to point in the right direction, in the correct direction. And when it points in the correct direction, the direction of the drift velocity is going to flip. So the new direction of the drift velocity is going to be in this direction. Originally, the drift velocity was the orange vector, was pointing in the wrong direction. So eventually, what's going to happen is that these surface charges are developed throughout the length, sorry, throughout the length of the wire in such a way that a uniform electric field in the proper direction has been set up inside the circuit. And let me draw the circuit. Let me try to draw drawing this distribution of charges approximately. <coughs> Now for ease, I'm just going to draw a single wire. I mean, this is just a thick wire. Now if I were to draw the distribution of charges, let me draw these in blue. Once equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium has been started, remember it's not static equilibrium. Once the current becomes steady, the electric field becomes steady and this distribution of charges becomes steady. Now the electric field is going to point in the proper direction. It's going to point at this, this is the electric field. The net electric field that is set up inside the wire, everything is going to point in the proper direction. And as a result, the drift velocity, Vd, is also going to point in the proper direction. And this drift velocity shows the flow of the sea of electrons. And remember, this sea of electrons is moving on a local scale. And current starts flowing through the circuit. So it's surface charges that are properly set up on the external peripheries of the conductor that result in the creation of electric current and the creation of electric field inside the conductors. Now, how much are these charges? In the previous lecture, I started off with a, with a numerical example. Let me come back to that example and give a rough back of the envelope calculation. Remember, it's a back of the envelope calculation. So we have a 90 degrees angle for a conductor. And we knew that if electrons were flowing like this with a drift velocity, then electrons would be deposited on this terminal, on this end, on this boundary of the wire. And this will cause the electric field to change its direction. And if you were to draw a Gaussian surface like this, inside this conductor, then what's going to happen is, if this is a really thin wire, so we ignore the electric field through this section, because this is really thin. So there's no flux that's coming out of this section. But there has to be an electric field in this direction here, because current has to flow. Now, if this electric field is E, we can find out the magnitude of the charge that exists here. Let, let's give a rough calculation. Suppose this cross-sectional area is 1 centimeter by 1 centimeter. And if I would like a current of 1 ampere to flow through this circuit, and I would like it to change its direction, I would like to find out what this charge should really be. Now, what's happening is that electric fields emanate from charges, as they do in Gauss's law. So, if this is my current, I know that my current is given by J times A. J is the current density. Now, J is sigma E, right? This is the conductivity. Suppose this is copper. So, the conductivity of copper, let's take this to be 10 to the power 8 ohm meters inverse. All right? Now, if I were to use Gauss's law, I would know that E times this area A must equal this charge. This is minus here. I put in a minus here. Uh, 
uh, the charge is Q over epsilon naught. And I would just like to take magnitude because I'm concerned with magnitudes. So this means that E A is Q over epsilon naught. This means that this charge Q has to be equal to epsilon naught E A. But E really equals J A over sigma A. So this is E and I have an A here. So this A goes away. I'm left with epsilon naught J A over sigma. Now let's find out this charge. Now remember this is just a back of the envelope calculation. If my epsilon is taken, it's really 8.85 into 10 to the power minus 12. Uh, Coulomb square over Newton meter square. So my Q, let's take this to be 10. Okay? So 10 into 10 to the power minus 12 into J. Now what's the now J A is simply the current. So epsilon naught I over sigma. My current is 1 ampere and my sigma is 10 raised to power All right. Let's look at the calculations again. I know that I equals J into A. J equals sigma E into A. Now I know from Gauss's law is that E into A, this is the flux through this surface, equals the charge imposed Q over epsilon naught, which means E A is Q over epsilon naught. Q is epsilon naught E A. Epsilon naught here, A here. E equals uh, <coughs> I over sigma A. So I have I over sigma A into A. I kya? Yahan Dekho. My Q is epsilon naught E A. Correct? This is my Q because Q over epsilon naught is E into A. Alright, now my E is given by this. J is sigma E which really means that E is J over sigma. So epsilon naught J over sigma A. Okay, now what is J into A? Current density into area is just I. Epsilon naught I over A. Uh, over sigma, sorry. Let's look at this quantity. This is 10 into 10 to the power minus 12. I is 1 ampere. This is 10 to the power 10. So this turns out to be 10 into 10 to the power minus 22 coulombs. Now what's the charge on a single electron? So I can also write this as 10 to the power minus 21 coulombs. Now the charge on a single electron is 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs roughly or 10 to the power minus 18 coulombs roughly. Okay? So this is even smaller than the charge on a single electron. So even if you have a tiny charge here which is of the order of the size of an electron it has enough capability to steer the direction of a current of magnitude 1 ampere which is really a large current because it's fatal, it's large current it can steer the direction of 1 ampere of current to 90 degrees so only minute surface charges are required on the bends so that electric current can follow the trajectory of the circuit these charges that are set up on the surface of the wire can be slightly larger but still they are really really small they are of the order of femtocoulombs, 10 to the power minus 15 of coulombs. So these are really small charges that are set up. But nevertheless, their presence is necessary if you would like current to flow through circuit. Alright? It's just like the, I am reminded of Archimedes' level principle in which he 
thought that if he could find a place where he could stand on, on, on in space and he had long enough level, he could lift the entire sun. It's exactly the same analogy at work here. You have a minute current that's of the order of one electron and even smaller and that can steer the direction of such a large current of the order of amperes. Okay? So these surface charges are necessary for current to flow, for current to take the proper bends and so on. Suppose you have a dead end inside a circuit. <clears throat> you have a battery and then you have a circuit. <coughs> it's of this kind. So you have a wire protruding, but then it sees a dead end. Of course, current is not going to flow through this wire. But there has to be a distribution of surface charges on this section of the wire, which prevents the formation of an electric field. So once steady state has been achieved, the feedback initial transients have faded away to give rise to a steady state condition. There is a distribution of negative charge here, some positive charge here, which does create an electric field in this section of the wire. However, this entire dead section or dead end acquires a uniform negative charge. There could be a slight higher charge here because of the bend, because we know bend surfaces give greater surface charge dense, but that's really small. But this entire section of the wire gets a negative charge and a uniform distribution of negative charge so that there is no electric field inside this section of the wire and current cannot flow through this wire. So surface charges are set up in dead ends as well, okay, which prevent the flow of current. It's all really nice. If I were to join this section back here, new surface charges will be established so that there will still exist an electric field will be created inside this section. And this creation of new electric fields happens at the speed of light. And the surface charges are created at really high speeds because they're available everywhere. They can respond to local sermons or local announcements that the electric field has been created because they're available everywhere they don't have to travel very far distances so the slow speeds doesn't really matter remember that if a current were flowing through this circuit and this is the direction of the conventional current and if i were to draw streamlines the currents are parallel to the axis of the conductor but here it would actually bump in the bump in the forward direction, they, they will bump slightly upwards because there is no charge here. So they are going to bump slightly upwards so the effective width of the wire in this section is going to be higher. So the resistance is slightly going to be smaller in this section of the wire. So everything is really subtle and if you have an insidious and innocent looking circuit that the battery is connected to a wire or a bulb, in fact a lot of electrical feedback is taking place here. Surface charges are redistributing, electric fields are being set up so that current can actually flow through the circuit. All looks really nice. Once again here this terminal is positively charged, this terminal is negatively charged. And there is a distribution of charges all the way through. And there is a gradient. <coughs> Let's take a detour into batteries a little bit because so far we ha I haven't drawn any electric field inside the batteries. Okay, so I'll spend 10 minutes on the battery, then I'll move on to the demonstration. They are the least understood of all circuit elements. Neither of your network analysis books will describe how a battery works. So how does a battery, what is the role a battery has in a circuit? And how is the electric field set up inside the battery? Now if you look at this circuit for example, drawn in a simple fashion,
Suppose this length is L, this length is L, and this length is L. Okay, and this length is tiny, and so it's ignorable. So it's a circuit of length 3L. This is a wire. Now if I would to look at the electric potential, suppose a positive charge in effect travels all the way. I'm talking about positive charges because they're easier to understand. Their flow is parallel to the electric field. So a positive charge moves along the circuit from this point to this point. This is a positively charged terminal. This is a negatively charged terminal. What's going to happen to its potential energy? It's going to drop. The potential energy is going to drop. Okay. So if this is my distance x along the wire, this is point L, this is point 2L, this is point 3L. And start off at some potential. Suppose the potential here is zero. So here the potential is zero and I'm going to draw the potential of the different points inside this wire. And if I multiply this with the charge on a single mobile charge carrier Q, it's going to give me the potential energy of this charge. So here the potential is zero. Here it's going to be higher, here it's going to be higher, here it's going to be higher. Because the electric field is parallel to, to the displacement of the positive charge. So when the electric field is parallel, then my E dot DL is positive. But the negative of this is the change in potential. So if I move from here to here, the difference in potential from this point to this point is negative, which means that this point is at a lower potential. This is at an even lower potential. This is at an even lower potential. The electric field that is set up inside the wire is E. So the slope of this potential is E. So what I can draw is a downward sloping line that starts off from a certain potential. This slope is E. So this potential is 3 times EL. So I start off with a positive potential, the potential drops, which means that if I have a positive charge carrier, this potential energy is going to drop. Its kinetic energy, by the way, is not going to increase because of resistance, because of the collisions. So there must be some external work that has been done on this object. Anyway, so this potential is going to drop, 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 till it reaches some datum level, which I call zero here. But I also know that from Faraday's law, the partial form of Faraday's law, I must have E dotted with DL about a closed path that is from point A to B and back to A, from A to B and back to A must be zero. Because there are no changing magnetic fields here. Now if this potential drops, there must be a rise in potential inside this battery. Now if you look at a positive charge inside the battery, if it were to come back to A from this, it has to go against the potential gradient. Its potential energy goes up because now it's moving towards a positively charged plate. So its potential energy goes back up and it restores its original value here. But this length of the battery is really small, is small s, even though it doesn't show in this circuit. It's a really small battery, this is a big wire. So it's some length of the battery s. So all of this potential must go back to its original value in this small length of the battery. Which means that this electric field must be really high the potential or the slope of this change in potential must be really high. And let's look at the direction of the electric field. The direction of the electric field is going to point in this fashion, from positive plate to the negative plate. Now you're moving a positively charged, positive charge against the direction of the electric field, which means potential energy is going up. So you must give energy to this charge. Where is that energy coming from? That energy is coming from the chemical reactions inside this battery. If I move a piece of chalk, chalk against the force of gravity, its potential energy is going up. Okay? Its potential energy is going up. So, I must supply energy to this piece of chalk. Where is that energy coming from? It's coming from the adenosine triphosphate inside my body. The energy storehouses, which is stored chemically inside the bonds 
in, in these molecules called ATP. And that energy has come from photosynthesis from the sunlight because I've taken my morning breakfast. So that energy has to be supplied. Once that energy is supplied, I release the chalk, the chalk falls back to the earth, and it loses all its potential energy. Exactly the same gravitational analogy is working here. Here, the electric field is doing work on the charge. Here, the charge is doing work on the electric field. So why can the positive charge move against the potential gradient? It can move because when you look at the chemical reaction, it gives you more energy back. The Gibbs free energy of this system is in a, is in a way such that overall when this chemical reaction takes place, energy is released. So in any case, what's going to happen is that over this small distance, small s, this potential is going to rise back to its original value. So that the change in potential over the entire loop is still zero. So that Kirchhoff's voltage law is satisfied. And this is simply Kirchhoff's voltage law. This slope is also called the EMF of the battery. And the EMF of the battery will give rise to a current that flows through the circuit. So this point is EMF into S. S is the length of the battery. The EMF into S must equal 3 E L because this condition has to be satisfied. So in this region of the circuit, the electric field and the displacement of the positive charges are parallel, and here they are anti-parallel. So this is how really a battery works. And this is how the potential profiles changes along the different regions inside the circuit. OK, so let me spend two or three minutes, or four or five minutes, on the chemical reactions that take place inside the battery and what's happening over there. And then the last five minutes will be devoted to this particular demo. <coughs> so this is the battery that is used in your cars, in your automobiles. So there is a box made of lead in which there are two electrodes. Now this electrode is lead oxide, which is a spongy material that is studded inside another frame which is itself made of lead and here we have lead. We have two dissimilar metals and they are placed inside a solution of sulfuric acid which is diluted with water. So this sulfuric acid has now ionized to give you protons and bisulfate, bisulfite ions. Okay? Now what's going to happen is the following. On this electrode, okay, and I also connect this to an external circuit through a resistor, R. Now let's see what's going to happen here. On this electrode, the lead dioxide is going to interact with the bisulfite ions Plus, something is coming in to give lead sulfate, PbSO4, plus water. Now let's balance out the equations. Uh, I have O2 here, I have 2 here, 4 hydrogens, I have 1 hydrogen here. So I need three hydrogens, three H pluses. Now let's look at it. So the chemical elements are uh, neutralized. So let's look at the charges. I have two positive charges here. So I must also have two electrons here. So let's look at this reaction. 
lead dioxide is reacting with the bisulfite ions in the presence of protons which are present inside this circuit, uh, inside this electrolyte and two electrons are coming in from somewhere. These two electrons are coming in from the mobile sea of electrons inside the circuit. So electrons come in, these electrons are also available on the electrode and they just go into solution, the electrons go into solution and this reaction takes place on the surface of this electrode and a molecule of lead sulfate is produced and water is also produced. So the concentration of water goes up which means that the acid becomes dilute. On the other section of this cell we have lead. Lead reacts with the bisulfite ions once again to give PbSO4 and it produces Uh, oh, right. PbSO4 plus H plus plus. All right. Now we need two electrons here. So that charge is balanced. So a reaction takes place, electrons go into this external circuit and for each lead sulfate molecule, remember in this reaction two electrons are traveling around the circuit. So two electrons come in here, two electrons go out here, these electrons form the current and for every two electrons two molecules of lead sulfate are produced. So this is a precipitate. It precipitates on the surface of this electrode or on the bottom of this cell. Okay, And that's why the EM of this battery diminishes with time because the contact of the electrode with the electrolytic cell decreases because lead sulfate is being precipitated. The acid becomes diluted. So a set of chemical reactions is taking place. It's producing new molecules and electrons as a result are flowing through this circuit. And this becomes a positively charged terminal. Why does it become a positively charged terminal? Because if you look at this reaction, three protons are moving towards this side and only one proton is being produced here. So there is a net movement of positively charged protons inside this electrolyte in this direction. And these protons deposit on side this electrode to give it a positive charge. And remember these protons are moving against the direction of the electric field that has been set up. This is what happens in a battery. The protons, the positive charge carriers are moving against the electric field gradient. So whenever this chemical reaction takes place, energy is released. That energy is available to do some work which means that it can blow a battery, it can run a motor, etc. Some of its energy is also lost within the internal resistance of this electrolytic cell. Okay? So this is how this conventional battery is working. And inside the battery, there's a net flow of positive charges, that is protons, if you look at these reactions, this is what is happening. Positive charges that are depositing on a plate that is already positively charged. The same thing happens in a Van de Graaff generator. If you look at your homework example number two, in a Van de Graaff generator you have a positive dome or a negative dome. Let's look at a positive dome and it's a belt that is moving upwards and it's transporting positive charges towards an already positively charged dome. So it's moving positive charges in the right, in the wrong direction, against the direction of the electric field. So this is what happens in a battery but you need to have this movement of charges in the wrong direction if you were to satisfy Faraday's law. So batteries also work on Maxwell's equation and they supply energy. For batteries the energy is supplied by the chemical reactions, by the electrode potential that is set up. Now I would like to finish off this class by a nice demonstration and this will lead nicely to the next particular topic I would like to cover. What I have here is something simple. Here if you observe, I have a hot plate. Inside the hot plate there is a beaker of water.
Inside the beaker of water, there is a thermocouple. So this is my thermocouple. This is measuring temperature, and the temperature it can be observed on this dial. This is where I focus. Go see my lights off. So this is my thermocouple. This thermocouple is connected to a temperature sensor. It's showing a temperature of 26 degrees centigrade. That's the temperature of water. And what I have inside, along with the thermocouple, is a wire. On the end of the wire, I have a small bead of a semiconducting material. And I would like to talk about semiconductors in the last class because 80% of modern Revenue, revenues in the modern world, they are associated with computers, information technology and semiconductors are at the heart of this huge industry. So I have a small semiconductor material and I am noting down the resistance of this semiconductor material. This resistance is coming up on an ohmmeter, on a multimeter and the resistance is shown to be 2.6 kilo ohms. So that's the resistance of the semiconductor. Now what I would like to do, I would like to heat up this water and I would like to keep my eyes on the resistance of the semiconductor. And I would just like to see how does the resistance change when the temperature of the semiconductor change which has been immersed inside the liquid that has been heated up by the hot plate. So I turn up the hot plate. It's going to take a few, some time. And you're going to do a bit of stirring as well. So eventually, this temperature is going to go up. It might take two or three minutes. And if you notice, the temperature has now gone up to 27 degrees centigrade. And if you look at the resistance, it's constantly dropping. It's 2.571, 2.567, 2.548. Temperature is constantly going up. It's 28 degrees centigrade, 2.41, 2.4 kilo ohms. So if I were to make a graph of this temperature with time, This is temperature, this is my resistance. It starts off at 2.5 kilo ohm, the semiconductor material, and with the passage of time, the temperature goes up, the resistance goes down. For a resistor, on the other hand, we would have observed a relationship somewhat like this for an ohmic resistor, like carbon. But semiconductors have the, totally the opposite behavior, and we know that the conductivity, sigma, is n e square tau over m. So if the temperature goes up, the mean coll collision time or scattering time must go down because now the ions are moving with a higher amplitude. So collisions must be more frequent. So if you have a target that is moving, then it's easy to hit the target because there are mobile electrons everywhere. If this time goes down, the conductivity must go down. But what we observe here is that the conductivity is actually going up for the semiconductor because the resistance is going down or the resistivity is going down. Now how do we explain this behavior for a semiconductor? In fact, in all of physics, whenever you would like to probe a physical property, you subject it to a temperature change. You want to measure heat capacities, you measure heat capacities at different temperatures. You want to measure conductivities, measure at different temperatures. That will tell you what the underlying mechanism for that process is. So how do semiconductors change the resistance with temperature? And if you observe here once again, the temperature has gone up to about 48 degrees centigrade while the temperature, while the resistance of this material has nearly more than halved. It's about one kilo ohm now. If I were to do this same experiment with a different material, with the resistor, the resistance would have gone up. 
So in my next lecture, I would like to describe how do semiconductors conduct electricity and how they are different from metals. And why have I chosen semiconductors? Because they are the workhorse of modern technology and hence modern civilization. So we're going to have a quiz tomorrow. I'm going to upload the solutions of the homework and we're going to have a midterm next Friday. Thank you very much.